Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. So in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about speeding up combat or making combat interesting, something like that. I see lots of videos pop up on my feed that claim to do just that, right? Your combat is boring. Your combat is terrible. Speed up combat. And typically it's the same five things that they're going to tell you to do. Give things less hit points, use morale, which is what we're going to talk about today, and several other things that you'll see if you watch those videos. If you want a full five point video, let me know in the comments below and I guess I could do that. But what I want to focus on actually is morale because the morale of your troops is going to be super important. Most things, if they're intelligent anyway, so not like zombies, are going to not want to die, right? They're going to retreat if they feel like they are being overwhelmed. They're going to, you know, live to fight another day, that kind of thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can use morale in our games. Now, I had had some comments about that sometimes I mention systems without going into them, so I'm going to do a quick overview of the systems I'm going to use. That way, if you want to check them out, you can. I'll put links in the description below, too, to the drive through RPG sources of these if you want to pick them up. So the first thing I'm going to look at is what would I call BX or Basic Expert. We're going to look at the basic book, actually, first. So this is my screen here. Uh, you know, this is the cover of it. It's the red one. Um, it's got this amazing arrow just cover on it. This uh, system, basically B and X, so this book plus the other one, put together form what is the kind of the core of what's now called old school essentials. The reason why I still use the original ones, aside from the fact that I just have them and they're, they're less expensive, is because I find these to be great sources for learning and teaching of D&D. Old school essentials which I'll also put a link to, is really, really well organized and great for table use. I find this to be my preferred system for learning. So that's the reason why I use this over that personally, even though I have both of them. So, you know, either one works or both if you want. The other thing we're going to use and refer back to now is something called chain mail. So chain mail is, I was going to say was, but is a war game for miniatures uh, created by uh, Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin. This is a game that was one of the early things for TSR. TSR is, the, of course, the people who created Dungeons & Dragons, Gary Gygax being one of the co-creators. So this came prior to Dungeons & Dragons. I'm not going to get into what influenced what or whatever, because I know people have made videos about that, but if you want to look into that kind of stuff, you can. What's important here, though, is that the original set of Dungeons & Dragons referred back to these rules quite a bit. And the BX system is effectively a rewrite of the Holmes basic system, which is a rewrite of original Dungeons and Dragons. So this is very much relevant. We're going to talk about how morale is used in, in BX and where I see the connection to chainmail and how using more of the chainmail stuff can make morale even more interesting and create some more dynamic combats. So first, let's take a look at the rules in BX. The first thing we might notice here is that morale is an optional rule in BX. Remember, this game was the basic version of Dungeons and Dragons. So it was kind of something you could add on if you wanted to use it. You didn't need to use it. Although most people that play today would say it's one of the things that makes the system really stand out. So let's look at it. Any creature in a battle may try to run away or surrender. Characters are never forced to do this. We're going to talk about that a little bit. A character always reacts in the way the player wishes. NPCs and monsters, however, may decide to run away or surrender. To handle the situation, each monster is given a morale score. Good morale, a high morale score, indicates a willingness to fight on regardless of the odds. Bad morale, a low morale score, means the monster will tend to panic and desire to withdraw from combat. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically each monster is given a number between 2 and 12. And you need to roll two six-sided dice and add them together when morale should be checked. And if it exceeds their morale, so in other words, if your morale is 12, it will never exceed it then the creature flees, the monster flees, as they call it in BX. This is a pretty simple system. It says here when to use it, right? After a side's first death in combat, either monsters or characters, when half the monsters have been incapacitated, killed, asleep due to magic, and so forth. Now, if they've checked morale twice and succeeded, they fight to the death, according to this. You can adjust it based on situations, but that's basically the way the rule works. Now, I think this is a great rule and creates all kinds of interesting situations in combat. You'll find with this that a lot of creatures, kobolds, goblins, and the like, are going to run on a failed morale check more times than not before the combat's over, right? They're going to take off. And this is cool. It works really well. And I recommend that you use it as is, at the very least, to help speed up combats. Why is it speed up combats? Because 
if there's 20 goblins there and you kill five of them, then the other 15 flee, the combat's over, right? I mean, at least it changes the vibe of the combat. They're running. You could chase them. They could do any number of things. Maybe they come back with reinforcements. There's all kinds of things that could happen in this situation. It's pretty open-ended. But in any case, it basically makes the combat not just be a, I hit you, you hit me, I hit you, you hit me, till everybody's dead. So this is great. And if we look at chainmail, what we see here is instability due to excess casualties. This is the first of effectively three types of morale in chainmail that we're going to talk about and modify for our purposes. Now, I'll note here that having a lower number is better in chainmail. Basically, you need to roll over the number to stay in combat. But if we look down here and we see things like peasants or levies versus heavy foot or elite foot versus medium horse, you can see that there's a percentage at which time the morale must be checked. So if you are a light foot, so somebody like a goblin, when 25% of their forces have been eliminated, and this is immediately, this is not at the end of the round, this is as soon as it happens. So you've got, you're fighting 12 goblins, three of them go down. As soon as that happens, before anything else happens, you roll this morale. In this case, again, you're trying to roll higher, but that's why you see eight or better. But what makes this interesting and different than what's in BX is that when they reach that number again, so when they lose another 25% of the original total, morale breaks automatically, which means that you don't have that they fight to the death thing with almost anybody except for the most elite troops, because you can see some of these here that say, like Mounted Knights is 50%, which means that you can never get below 50% again, right? Because that would be all of them gone. So this makes a slightly different vibe to the morale. Number one, now you're almost virtually guaranteed things like goblins and kobolds and orcs and smaller stuff will run at some point during the combat. Again, making the combat shorter, more dynamic, uh, because you might want to chase them off, things like that. But there's another type of morale. What we have here is a cavalry charge. So I guess it probably makes sense. When a bunch of people on horses charge at you with lances, right, you're likely going to have to check your morale to see if you can withstand this. But what if we take this to another level? What if there's just some kind of a show from the player characters or against the enemies that, uh, you know, a fireball would be an example or a sleep spell where it really shows an immense power. It could even be something that they're faking, like using phantasmal forces and stuff like that. This could also trigger a morale check. This morale check happens generally before melee is engaged. That is, the goblins are 100 feet away from the PCs. The magic user uses a phantasmal force to show some crazy demon shape or whatever, they check morale. If they fail, they retreat. And we're going to get into the mechanics of this in a second. So again, this is another way that combat can be broken really quickly. You can drive off forces right away before it even starts. But there's a third thing. Now we're looking at post Malay morale. This is one of those situations where if you looked at this, you might be like, hold on, this isn't about dragons. This is math. But I'm going to have a version that's going to be simpler. But effectively, what happens here is you weigh the power of both sides of the troops at the end of each round of melee. And based on the difference there, different things can happen. Either a partial retreat, melee continues, a full rout, and so on. This, again, now makes it so that every single round of combat, assuming that they make it to the end because they haven't failed morale through the other way, you're going to roll some kind of quick morale check. So combat could break at any point. So let me show you my old school or BX or OSE or whatever you want to call it, versions of these three types of morale and how we can simply use them in our game to make the combats even more exciting because who knows what's going to happen. We're over here on my iPad and I've basically got some notes for myself here so I can explain it to you guys. Effectively, we've got three types of uh, morale. Lost due to casualties. This is the most, this is the closest to what BX has now, right? Effectively, I made notes of their morale. So a creature with morale two to six makes the first check at 25% and they automatically flee at 50%. A morale of seven to nine, they check at a third the force's loss and they automatically run at 66%. And if they have a morale of 10 or 11, then they check it at 50 and they never auto flee. Of course, if their morale is 12, then you never check their morale really because you can't fail a morale check if you have a 12 morale. Just switching the standard system to this morale system will make combats go faster because all of your 
large groups of monsters typically have morales in the range of six to nine, right? So they're all going to probably run when about two thirds of them are finished off. So you almost always get an auto flee unless the party like really takes them out with something powerful, like a like a spell or something. Okay, so for the second part here, we're going to look at the the cavalry thing. So I wrote charges from cavalry or large beasts or displays of power like magic, right? Really powerful magic. Make morale check depending on the situation. The morale is reduced by one or two. So in other words, depending on the, the type of monster they are, they might have a, a slightly lower morale because of the display that you put on, right? If a, if you're fighting kobolds and you use a fireball and you wipe out a huge chunk of them, but not enough to make them flee the other way, then this may, or we put up a wall of fire, let's say, this may make them flee more often than, let's say, a more powerful creatures like bugbears or something. Okay, then if it's failed, so if they fail this, they move back one and a half moves. So they move back one and a half times their combat speed. So if your combat speed was 20, you're going to move back 30. And they have to roll a d6. If they don't get a one or a two, then they're routed. And we're going to talk about routed in a second. If they get a one or a two, then they kind of move back in good order and they can stand, stand to defend themselves. It's like you threw the fireball or the wall of fire in front of them. They move back. Now, this gives the party some options, right? Let's say that the Magic user only has that Wall of Fire spell left, and everybody's very wounded, and they come upon 60 goblins. Now, they throw up this Wall of Fire. Back, you terrible goblins! I will destroy you! Knowing it's really all they got. Goblins have to roll here. They fail the morale. They back up one and a half moves. Now the party's further away. They can run, right? This doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to attack them. You might. They might back up, and now you've got better range for your archers, right? you got all kinds of different reasons why this could work. But effectively, they're going to back up. If they are routed, which we'll talk about in a second, that's a whole other thing. But if they just back up, then the next round, you'll just they'll just move forward again as usual. And they'll have to, of course, move use their move to move in, which means, again, the party's going to have a bit of an advantage. I'll note here that I wrote at the bottom, Dread Pirate Roberts. You probably get the reference. Now, the final one, which again might seem complex when you look at it in chainmail, is not so hard here. This is post melee. Effectively, at the end of every round, so after both sides have gone, we check and we compare the total hit dice. So if you've got a character, if you've got a party of second level characters, let's say four of them, that's eight, right? And you've got 10 orcs, that's 10. So it's 10 versus eight, that's a difference of two. We refer back to our chart back two moves in good order. Now, I'm up in the air about this. Part of me says that, just like in BX, player characters should never be forced back. However, their, their henchmen will be, right? So if the henchmen are forced back two moves, then the player character should have the option to also move back. Now, I'll make a note that I wrote in good order on here. We'll go back here so you guys can see. What moving back in good order effectively means is that there's no like free hit. There's no opportunity attack. There's none of that. You get to just move back. Uh, you can move back in good order two moves. You can move back in good order one moves. But then you get up to a difference of six or seven. And now we're talking about retreating. When somebody's retreating, the non-retreating party will get a free attack against them at plus two. And they'll go back one move. Now, a route is something entirely different. Not only will they get a free, a free attack, you know, assuming they're within melee range, uh, at plus two. But then the next round, as we noted above... They've got to roll a d6. On a 1 or a 2, they're regrouped. If they do not roll the 1 or a 2, when they are attacked again, or if they are attacked again, they cannot return blows. So they basically can't attack until they regroup, and they've got to roll this 1 or a 2 on a d6, or they're going to basically get attacked twice, right? And then, of course, 10 plus is surrender. I'm sort of up in the air, but I kind of don't necessarily think that I would want to force the player characters to do any of these things. It, with the exception of uh, retreat and route, right? They would have to. You're getting pushed back. You have no choice. The moving back in good order, I think I would give them the opportunity to do it if they wanted to, but the henchmen would 100% do it. So if you've got four player characters with five henchmen and you get a move back two, well, the henchmen are moving back two. If you want to stay forward as the PCs, you can do that. <laughs> but of course, now you don't have the henchmen that help defend you. So keep that in mind. All right. So this is basically pretty simple to insert into pretty much any game whole cloth. If you are playing a different game that's not uh, OSC or BX or Chainmail or Original Dungeons & Dragons or anything like that that has a standard morale system, 
you could just put this in and it would replace it. Any, any part of this, really, you could just do the Malay, you could just do the other one, or you could kind of manipulate it for your system. So if you want to run this system in, let's say, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, they already have a DC 10 wisdom saving throw as the baseline for morale. First of all, I think the DC is too low and is arbitrary, right? It should be based on the situation and also the, the monster, right? I know it's a wisdom saving throw, but if you were to succeed in the saving throw, then you stay. But what if you're clearly going to die the next round? My preference, though, would be to just scrap that whole DC thing altogether and just use the system whole cloth. You could just set a morale rating based on the enemies and how tough you think they are, and then just make it a straight roll with no, no kind of uh, modifier for wisdom, because I don't see where wisdom comes in there. So you could just be like, okay, well, goblins have a morale of, you don't have to beat a morale of 15, right? So the DC is 15 to make a goblin stay. Whereas like somebody like a hobgoblin might have like a, a 12 because they're more like soldiers, right? Generally speaking. So they'll it's easier for them to, to pass the morale check and stay. That's probably how I would do it. But, you know, let me know if you guys play 5e more often, if you have an option here. Let me know if any of you play Chainmail and if you use these systems. I think that they're really interesting because they change the battlefield, right? You charge up, you show magic, people back up. After a melee, people move. This movement is forced. What I've found in games that offer opportunity attacks is that rarely do people disengage once they're engaged in melee because they don't want to take a free opportunity attack against him unless they've got some special skill that allows them or that kind of thing. So this basically sets you up so that these things can happen. There can be natural breaks in the grouping. The, the They clash and they back up and they clash and they back up. And I think it creates a much more dynamic battlefield. Let me know. I would be curious if anybody wants to use this. I can make a PDF of this and put it out there, let me know in the comments below if you want to uh, have this in a PDF format that so you can try it. And uh, if you haven't already, go ahead, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell so you get notifications, and I'll see you next time.